Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin-Smith. Tonight, there is international concern about deepening turmoil in Chad following the death of President Idris Deby. His absence throws the battle against jihadist groups in the Sahel into doubt. Also, we hear from a former U.S. ambassador to Nigeria about his hopes that Western nations, particularly Washington, will rethink their diplomatic dealings with Africa's most populous nation. And sections of a near 100-year-old library containing rare manuscripts on African studies has been lost in the blaze that engulfed parts of the University of Cape Town earlier this week. But first, a day after news of the death of Chadian President Idris Deby and his son has taken over with the support of the military and rebel forces have threatened to march on the capital. There's international concern that deepening turmoil in the country will undermine anti-jihadist efforts in Africa. At just 37 years old, Mohamed Deby is the new face of Chad. As a young general, he was in charge of his father's security detail. Now, following Idris Deby's death, his son has been thrust into the spotlight as the head of the country's transitional military council. The body is made up of generals from Deby's inner circle who have vowed to organize free elections in the coming 18 months. The defense and security forces are not seeking to seize power. We assure you that the members of the Transitional Military Council will hand over power to a civilian government. The country has reopened its borders a day after they were closed amid growing instability. But a curfew will remain in place at night. On the streets of the capital and Jamana, locals have mixed reactions. From a security point of view, the president played an important role. And now we're already seeing some instability. So we're worried about his sudden death. They're already talking about the dissolution of parliament. We have a constitution, so in my opinion, it's a coup d'etat. The army has said that President Idris Deby died during clashes with rebels in the north of the country as he led troops fighting armed insurgents based in neighboring Libya. On April 11th, the rebels crossed into Chad and were thought to be advancing towards the capital as voters were heading to cast their ballots. News of Debbie's death emerged just hours after the leader had been officially declared the winner of the presidential election. Now, at least one person was killed during a school kidnapping in northwestern Nigeria. It's still not clear how many students were taken from Greenfield University in Kaduna State during Tuesday's attack. At least 20 are missing, but some may have fled rather than have been abducted. Now, recent mass kidnappings have prompted six northern states to shut schools. Nigeria overall is facing a surge of instability. A reg regional task force, which includes Chad, was part of efforts to tackle the cross-border threat of Nigeria's Boko Haram insurgents, who've operated out of the country's northeast since 2009. For a closer look at the country, we're joined by John Campbell, a former U.S. ambassador to Nigeria and a senior fellow for Africa Policy Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. John, thanks so much for speaking to us. Um, now, there is a lot of international concern about the destabilizing effect that Idris Deby's death will have on Western counterterrorism operations in the region. Do you think that this suggests the weakness in Western security strategies? Well, I think it certainly suggests a dilemma. Uh, we have tied ourselves, not just in the Sahel, but in other parts of Africa, uh, to strongmen-type governments that often do not command widespread allegiance and support from their citizens. Now, you've recently written a book, uh, Nigeria and the Nation State, Rethinking Diplomacy with the Post-Colonial World. Um, in it, you're calling for a re-evaluation from Western countries, particularly the US, in terms of their diplomatic dealings with Nigeria and other post-colonial states. Why do you think that this is necessary? I think it's necessary because uh, so many post-colonial governments are uh, out of touch with their people. 
uh, do not command widespread uh, support from their people. And so if, in fact, you are going to get your, your, your particular position across, you need to approach the grassroots to a much greater extent than we have up to now. Uh, religious leaders, traditional rulers, business people, journalists, opinion makers. And do you think that your views are reflected by African thinkers, by Nigerian thinkers? Uh, by some. Uh, there is a, an internal debate that goes on in Nigeria about the nature of the state and about how the state could be brought closer to the Nigerian people. Now, in your book, you say that you saw a marked change in the security of Nigeria between 2004 and 2005. Recently, we've seen there's been an even greater escalation in conflict. Um, I alluded to it earlier in the story that uh, we mentioned about that rash of kidnappings we've seen in the Northwest. Of course, also the ongoing insurgency from Boko Haram. What do you put this trend of instability in the country down to? Uh, it's multifaceted. Uh, at one level, it's the result of a huge increase in the population. Uh, also a huge increase in the population of cattle, uh, which means lots of conflicts over land use. There is the jihadi dimension. Uh, the jihadi groups of various sorts all seek to destroy the Nigerian government. Uh, there is climate change with the rise in sea levels in the south, the Sahara creeping, uh, uh, creeping towards the south and a government which, up to now at least, has been unable to meet these challenges. Now, you're trying to encourage uh, Western nations, the U.S., to do more to, to incorporate kind of internal political structures in the way that they come up with diplomatic strategies to deal with, deal with Nigeria. But is this necessary? Is this really a priority when it comes to the U.S.? Well, it ought to be. Uh, Africa and Nigeria traditionally have never been a particular focus of U.S. diplomatic uh, interests and concerns, but it better be now. Uh, uh, take something as simple as population. Uh, there are more people in sub-Saharan Africa now than there are in all of North America and, and Central, Central America. Nigeria, by 2050, is anticipated having a population of 450 million, at which point it will have displaced the United States as the third largest country in the world by population. Africa matters. Africa is big. Thanks very much. John Campbell, former U.S. ambassador to Nigeria, they're speaking to me. Now, up to 150,000 Burundian nationals have been living in Tanzanian refugee camps after fleeing the violent political unrest that followed the contested re-election of the late President Pierre Kurunziza. Six years later, Tanzania wants refugees to go home, but many say that they're still too afraid. Shelley Sitbin has more. The ceremony features traditional Burundi dances and music. But some of the refugees watching it are too tired to keep their eyes open. They've been living in Tanzania refugee camps for years after escaping violence in their country. This specific ceremony was organized to encourage refugees to cross the border back into Burundi. I haven't come here to invite you to return to your country or not. But the fact is that at present, Tanzania has no reason to continue receiving refugees from Burundi. So keep registering to return home voluntarily. About 300,000 people have fled Burundi since the 2015 electoral violence. Tanzania has taken in half of them to refugee camps exclusively. Some have returned to Burundi in recent months. Others believe it's still too dangerous there. Tanzania has received us well, but attitudes have begun to change. Officials come from time to time and tell us to go home and build our country. But a refugee is not forced to return home to build a country. Usually a refugee is the one who knows why he fled his country. A UN report from this month says Tanzania must stop pressing refugees to leave. And more, it has received testimonies saying people who were political opponents in Burundi have been abducted, arbitrarily detained, and some have been returned by force to Burundi, where they have been arrested. 
some have disappeared. The UN has helped refugees who do want to return to Burundi to make that trip safely. The University of Cape Town appears to have suffered some of the most damage in the aftermath of one of the worst blazes the city has seen in years. Part of a near 100-year-old library containing rare manuscripts on African studies has been lost. Out-of-print literature, hand-drawn maps, rare films and archives documenting seminal moments in South African history. Much of the Jagger Reading Room's collection has gone up in smoke. It was horrifying. It was a deep-seated sadness that this had to happen because there are some things that are irreplaceable. There are some things we can buy in the future, but there are those elements that are irreplaceable and you will never know where to get them from. There were 85,000 books and 3,500 films in the reading room, which was built in the 1930s and was home to the University of Cape Town's Special Collections Library. As staff take stock of the damage, about half of the collection is expected to be lost, including many African studies books. The other half on the lower floors was saved after being sealed off behind steel shutters. Academics are anxiously waiting to hear the fate of a few items in particular, including an important series of interviews with prisoners on Robben Island from the 1870s and a Dutch Bible from 1535 believed to be the oldest in South Africa. Thankfully, many of the works have been digitised, though for some scholars, it'll never be the same as the real thing. Well, that's it for Iron Africa. Thanks for joining us and do so again. Take care. Special event. Hi, I'm Thomas Pesquet. Join me on France 24 and RFI for the entire duration of my next trip called Mission Alpha. Discover life on board the space station, scientific experiments and other moments I'll be sharing with you while away from Earth for six months. Follow Thomas Pesquet on board the International Space Station on France 24 and RFI.